Hey, I'm Andy Chanley from 88.5 FM, and this is our Here at Home series of interviews. And joining us today, we got Hall of Famer Lindsey Buckingham right here. How you doing, Lindsey? I'm great. How are you? Doing great. Uh, it's good to see you. Good to um, see you. I'll start off with the uh, the important stuff. Uh, you've got a new album out, Lindsey Buckingham. Uh, it's on sale wherever you buy music. Uh, it's a really fine album. Congratulations on it. Thank you. And uh, 88.5 FM, we've been playing, uh, well, we played a couple of songs off it, uh, I Don't Mind, and uh, now playing the song, uh, Swan Song. I, I hope you forgive me for what I did. I I'm a uh, music director at the station, and, you know, when the lead single came out over the summer, we played that, and then uh, they sent me the whole album, and I listened to it, and when I got the Swan Song, I, I just kind of stopped in my in my tracks, and I played it for our, our, our program director, Mookie, and, and his face kind of melted when he saw it, too. Uh, usually uh, uh, record labels don't like it when we do that kind of thing, but we've been playing the heck out of that song. Uh, it's just so different. Well, I appreciate that, that you would sort of scan the landscape of, of, you know, the whole album and then gravitate to something that's a little more edgy, you know, because, because I, I really did start off wanting to make a, 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 a pop album, but I didn't want to lose the edges and certainly Swan Song and a couple of others represent the more uh, <clears throat> risk-taking kind of approaches, I guess. So it's great that you gravitated to that. Yeah, I mean, it really seems like you've been reinvigorated here with with this album, and uh, uh, and you're you're entertaining yourself and doing. It. Please tell me it's not your swan song. <laughs> no, that was that was uh, you know written about relationships and and not careers. <laughs> All right, good, good. Uh, I saw you in concert at uh, Solo at the Saban Theater. And gosh, I guess it's probably a decade or so ago now. I guess it was the, the, the like 2011, probably. Yeah, Seeds We Sow Tour, I think. Yes. And the in most interesting thing happened. You know, you played uh, the requisite, you know, half dozen Fleetwood Mac era songs and uh, your bigger solo hits. But the rest of the show was all music off of this album that I had not even heard yet. And, and no one in the audience uh, pretty much had heard yet. I was really taken by how much I enjoyed hearing the new stuff, n n not being familiar with it at all. And my plus one agreed with me emphatically on it uh, as well. Uh, what do you think that that owes to? Is that is it because you tend to write in a you know kind of melodic, um, uh, uh, hooky uh, uh, fashion or? Uh, uh, your dashing good looks. What, what do you think? Uh, the <laughs> well, I don't think it has anything to do with the dashing good looks, but uh, <laughs> I think part of it is that, you know, over a, a 40 plus year span, I have sort of made the choice to try to uh, continue to grow as an artist and to continue to try to do things on my own terms. And and, and that has to be basically done, mostly done, I would say, you know, within the context of solo work. And, um, but I, you know, I've sort of done this tightrope between that and the, what was expected of me in terms of being in a big machine like Fleetwood Mac. And so uh, I think over a period of time, the, the material that, that emerges from solo albums just keeps representing the things that I've learned and, and where my passion lives and where my growth lives and where my aspiration to aspire to be an artist for hopefully the right reasons lives. And I think that that translates to stage very well. You know, I mean, obviously there, from another point of view for someone like you who appreciates that ethic, and I think you do, um, you're going to you're going to get uh engaged by the challenge and and the, the newness of, of that um and the creativity hopefully of that you know as opposed to again what might be more expected which is that requisite number of Fleetwood Mac songs which I couldn't get away without playing <laughs> so I think it's both those things yeah people will be out there with uh torches and pitchforks if you didn't give them yes yes you gotta you, and even in the show we're doing now you know we, we're ending the show with Fleetwood Mac songs because the 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 psychology is sort of okay we've we've you know 
uh, we've gone through our paces for you and we've challenged you and and now here's a little relaxation for you you know yeah uh, when you and, and Christine McVie were out doing the, the Buckingham McVie uh, tours, uh, you, you actually did uh, a show that we presented at my old radio station, and, and it was it was just a, a really great uh, show. And I was saying to my wife at the time uh, when we were watching y- you from out front, um, they're, okay, uh, music critics, they might slot in some lead guitarists over the course of history above you and there may be lead singers that they might slot in above you but the list of lead guitarists and singers people who play and sing at the same time is it's a very very short list you have to be aware of that and and i would imagine that's a point of pride for you well i think you know those two things are very important and i think just everything else about my approach, which is just, you know, trying to uh, paint paintings with your music, to try to find your own vocabulary with your music, to try to work your guitar playing in into the service of this and the fabric of the song in ways which is less noticeable and, and yet elevates the, the end product more rather than somebody who's just noodling over the top. All of that, I think, it enters into it, you know, and it may be, like you say, if you break it down, certainly there are uh, uh, much better singers and, and more facile guitar players than I, but I think it just comes down to just the approach and, and the, the bigger picture of how the whole thing uh, fits together, you know, and, and that's, that, that's really what's most important to me. Well, I, I appreciate that answer, but I think you're being modest too, because, uh, and here's my proof, the two times that you've stepped away from Fleetwood Mac, uh, you weren't replaced by one person, you were replaced by two. <laughs> that's true. You know, and, and, and this last time someone could say, okay, uh, Mike Campbell uh, to do the guitar part and, uh, and, and uh, Neil Finn to do the singing, although they both do uh, the opposite as well. Uh, that's one argument, but uh, in the eighties, it was uh, uh, Rick Vito and, and Billy Burnett who are two guitar players, um, if you're honest, I mean, that has to be a, a little bit of uh, a point of pride that uh, it, it's hard to replace, you know, Lindsey Buckingham in that equation. Well, I mean, again, I, I, I suppose there is some truth to that. Uh, but I but I think the if there's something that was missing from both those situations once when I was not in the band both both times, went beyond that again i think it was just having a musical vision that i could that i could bring to the band and i could uh, provide leadership for um and and sort of have a be a kind of a musical visionary that would take the band to places that that would fulfill its potential and i, I think both the times that i left that some of that element was missing uh my last question about the band, actually, um, sure. it, you know, all of the stuff, the rumors era stuff, that stuff's been prosecuted to death. And I, I, I don't have interest <laughs> in, in going back and talking about that. And I'm sure you don't either. Uh, but uh, all the back and forth about uh, this this last time, just it seemed uh, particularly acrimonious. But what I've heard you say about it, it kind of relates to a question we were we were uh, I was asking a bit ago in your answer that about seeing you and hearing all uh, mostly new material was that the sticking point between you and the band you didn't want to go and do a hits review and you wanted to play some some newer things and they didn't want to do it is that it well i mean it, it came down to a lot of things i uh oddly enough you know this album that is now out and that we're now in the middle of touring um has been ready to go for about three years and uh I did get into some adversarial moments with other members of the band uh, preceding uh, the the last tour because I had when we got off the road uh, for you know the the album with Christine, I had wanted to put this album out pretty much back to back and then go out and do uh, another like three months worth of touring. And I asked the band 
if they would um, kick the tour down the road a little bit. And, and it was a bit problematic because some of the structure of the tour had already been started to be put into place. And, you know, certain people, uh, I don't have to mention names, but were, were just not uh, open to the idea of waiting that extra three months, which was disappointing to me because certainly, you know, we have all waited and tried to work around everyone else's individual concerns when, when need be. And that's what had kept us together for 43 years. Um, and that kind of set a, a, a mood that, that sort of kept going into some other things that happened. And it really just came down to, um, you know, one person kind of uh, giving the others an ultimatum that either I had to go or that person would go. And uh, so it just was disappointing especially given all that we've been through on an emotional level and on personal, the personal levels, the interactions, the, all of the things that we rose above uh, in our personal lives in order to uh, fulfill our destiny. And that goes you know, back to pre-Rumors, but certainly the Rumors album itself was, was the subtext of that and much of the appeal of that was that, that we were acting somewhat heroically in terms of rising above personal difficulties. And so for, you know, for what happened in, in the beginning of 2019 or whenever it was to, to happen, at this point, you know, I wasn't disappointed about not being involved in another Fleetwood Mac tour. I was disappointed that we were somehow not respecting the legacy that we would built at that point and couldn't come together in order to to do that so you know that's just the way it's gone yeah i don't know i, I i've lived long enough to not bet against things like that happening eventually so we'll, we'll see we'll see, we'll how it see. Turns out. anything's possible it's Fleetwood mac right <laughs> <laughs> that's right uh, in the meantime, uh, you gave us a little bit of a, a health scare. There was a heart issue, and then uh, there was speculation about, uh, gosh, will, will, you, will your voice uh, recover and all this stuff? Uh, mm -hmm. You put all of that to rest with this album. You, you sound like you're in fine form. How, how, how are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Yeah, I mean, I, I ended up having a bypass. And, uh, and, you know, this is one of the reasons, that was one reason that the album got kicked down the road. And then tw twice, really, we we were poised to, uh, mount a tour. One time we were actually, we'd actually begun rehearsing and then of course the pandemic kicked in. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, yes, it, it took a while, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling great. Um, my voice is great. Uh, my energy seems to be, you know, uh, exactly where it needs to be at this point. And uh, it's, it's great to be back. Yeah, I was just saying that David Crosby uh, a couple months ago, he, he's a decade your senior, or your uh, junior, but, uh, or your senior rather. Uh, but, I hope, uh, I hope <laughs> get my yeah. juniors and seniors mixed up. But I told him, I think he's making some of the best music of his life. Uh, and it certainly sounds like you're invigorated on this Lindsey Buckingham album. Uh, well, yeah, to, I mean, you, you, again, I think part of it is that, that I have found a way to work and, um, it's all been manifested, not all, but largely been manifested through solo work and a solo process. And, you know, because you, you, I made the choice after rumors not to fall into the trap of being uh, overly responsive or uh, making choices based on external expectations. And, and, you know, because up to that point, everything we'd done had been from the heart, from the gut, instinctual and uh, that's the way to be an artist and and i think over time that that it's just that in many ways i've just gotten better and better at my craft and so i hopefully that'll continue for as long as i can keep it up tell me about your first guitar well you know when i first started playing i was six years old when my brother brought home heartbreak hotel 
And I first started learning chords on a ukulele. And then when I was about seven, um, my parents got me a three quarter size harmony acoustic guitar for Christmas, um, which I think cost about 35 bucks back then. And, um, and I had that until I was probably about 11. And then I, yeah, that, I mean, that was perfect for a, a young boy who was, uh, you know, probably too small to play a full-size guitar. <laughs> and, um, and it, you know, it was really how I taught myself with, with a chord book. And um, then I got a, a used Martin uh, mahogany top guitar, 1940s guitar, and, uh, and was off, off to the races, you know. You still have that little harmony? I do not. No, I think we traded it in for the Martin. I still have the Martin floating around, though. Uh, you mentioned uh, your brother, uh, your brother, uh, Greg, who I, I share a birthday with. I, I noticed when I was uh, looking into it, uh, won silver in swimming at the 68 Olympics. Yeah, indeed. And I'm just uh, commenting from the cheap seats here. I'm not trying to psychoanalyze, but <laughs> it, it appears to me that having uh, an Olympic swimmer, Olympic uh, you know, medal winning swimmer, and a uh, a rock and roll hall of famer in the same family. It seems like you come from some deliberate people. Um, I don't see much written about your your upbringing. Uh, was achievement kind of exalted in your family? Well, I don't know. I, I think I, I don't think it was per se. My 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 father um, had taken over uh, the coffee business that that had been started by my mother's grandfather. And he wasn't the best businessman in the world. So he, I, I can't say he was like overly goal driven or overly success driven. I think what we did have though, was an extremely stable, supportive family that, that valued the sense of community over everything else. Um, I grew up in a, I guess you would call it an upper middle-class family up in Atherton, up in Northern California, which is, to some degree now been co-opted by those from the Silicon Valley. <laughs> mm -hmm. But a very quiet, beautiful place to grow up. But, you know, I was lucky enough to have all the same friends from kindergarten through high school. And, you know, we just had, our house was, was the go-to place for everyone. And there was just such a sense of community and, and, and sort of group support that I, that I think it just allowed us to sort of soar, you know, and, and, and my, I don't think my mom and dad really wanted me to pursue a career in the entertainment industry, probably with good reason. It's, it's not an unfounded concern that they might've had about the pitfalls there and the, the lack of stability that potentially exists, but they also knew that, that I needed support and I needed to follow my heart and I did, and I, I think that I can put a lot of my ability to follow through on that and to be focused enough to pull it off to the kind of family life I had. Yeah, it worked out pretty well. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so far so good. <laughs> what do you think you'd be doing if music were not a thing, if you had never been given that guitar? What, what do you think you would have ended up doing with your life? I really, I have no idea. Maybe, I mean, I was a pretty good artist, so I'm, you know, maybe a commercial artist or something. Maybe we'll have an exhibit of Lindsey Buckingham. Well, maybe not. <laughs> not, not. Not stuff that I necessarily want to tout, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the album is something you should sure be proud of. It's called Lindsey Buckingham, and it's available now wherever you buy records. Uh, you'll hear uh, songs like Swan Song on 88.5 FM if you listen. Uh, Lindsey Buckingham, uh, it's been great to uh, to chat with you. Thanks for uh, being so candid and, and so generous with your time. Oh, my pleasure. It was great talking to you. All right. All the best uh, and happy holidays. Same to you. Take care. 88.5 FM, KCSN and KCSN HD1, Northridge, Los Angeles. KSBR and KSBR HD1, Mission Viejo. A service of California State University, Northridge and Saddleback College. Member-supported public radio. Streaming on the web at 88.5 FM.org.